Hi, this video is designed for CEOs of small organizations, heads of divisions, or future leaders who would like to start thinking more strategically about their work their teams are doing so they can build this competency. When I was doing my MBA, I must have spent some 200 hours in strategy courses. We're going to cover the subject in just a few minutes, so put on your seatbelts. As you go through this video and create your own strategy, don't worry if you're doing it the right way or not. You're the consumer of this exercise, so ignore and change whatever you feel like so it works for you. The first step in the strategic planning process is fixing the mission, values, and vision of your organization, division, or team. The mission statement addresses the human need for purpose, meaning, and context. It's meant to inspire us by answering the question, what's the point of what we do? Some examples of mission statements I love are Wikipedia. Imagine a world where every single person is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. Or Facebook, give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. Or Tesla, to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Once you've got your mission statement, the next step is to define the values you want to live by. In the way we think about values and principles, they're not hard and fast rules. Honesty may be the best policy, but if a terrorist asks me where my kids are hiding, I'm going to lie. So values and the way we look at them help you make tough decisions when you're stuck. And the answer is not obvious. Values help you break through dilemmas. And values are not that helpful unless you really discuss specific examples. So for example, with respect to our value for respect for individuals, we decided what it meant was we ask permission before we give any feedback to participants of our programs, that we never tell them what they should do. And we never tell people they're a certain type of person. So to make values helpful, make sure you discuss specific example of what it does mean and what it does not mean. Otherwise, they're too vague to provide guidance. They sound nice, but we just forget to ignore them after a while. Now, mission statements and values are usually pretty fixed. They're not really meant to change. But vision statements usually refer to what is the next step for us. With a medium term time horizon, maybe two to five years, they are dreams with deadlines. One of the most inspiring and impactful vision statements of all time was in John F. Kennedy's moon speech of 1962, landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth by the end of the decade. The Americans landed men on the moon in 1969, and after that, even if the mission and values remained constant, NASA would have probably updated their vision statement to fit their next challenge. So once you've got your mission, values, and vision in place, the next step is to start thinking about what you need to do to make it happen. And that's where we can use a SWOT analysis, perhaps the most well-known tool from the world of strategy. Here we answer the question, what are our internal strengths and weaknesses? What are the external threats and opportunities? You can pause the video here to have a look at the questions so you can do your own SWOT. And we put them in a link to a downloadable file below this video for your easy reference. But to give a quick example of a SWOT for still water during the coronavirus pandemic lockdown, the threat was of course that almost all our business was from in-person workshops, 100% of which got cancelled in one week for pretty much the entire year ahead. A weakness we had is we had no organizational expertise in creating online content or IT solutions for that matter. But one of the strengths we have is that we have a very small team with hardly any fixed costs in terms of salaries or office rent. So even if our cash flow was impacted, we're not going to make losses. Another strength is because we're so small, we can make almost instantaneous decisions about various strategic decisions, design new content, shoot videos at home for online programs and so on. And there were lots of blue skies opportunities that suddenly opened up too. Because all trainings are now virtual, we could potentially do programs for new overseas clients. There's potentially a huge demand for leadership programs on dealing with change and ambiguity, or even something as basic as dealing with the challenges of working from home. There's the opportunity to get our work-life balance on track because we're no longer traveling for workshops. And biggest of all, perhaps, there was the opportunity to think of fresh and exciting new ways about how to design programs that could make our work even more impactful. But one of the things you want to consider when you're thinking through your SWOT are the words of one of my ex-bosses who told me once, there are only two things to remember about strategy. One is that strategy is about making choices. And the second is that those choices have to be consistent with each other. If you're trying to be better at everything, that's continuous improvement. And it's not wrong, but it's not strategy. For example, if you try to make your video conference more secure, then it becomes harder to access. Now, Microsoft Teams might make a strategic decision to focus on security because the clients of Microsoft are large corporations who value that. Zoom might make a strategic decision to focus more on ease of use for members of the general public, but that might mean it's less secure. 
there is a choice to be made here and that choice also needs to be consistent with the rest of the business, who the customers are, what the strengths and weaknesses of the organization is and so on. Of course, Microsoft Teams will want to make their video conference software easier to use and Zoom will try to make their software more secure. That's important too, but that's not usually what we refer to as strategy. That's continuous improvement. So one question you've got to ask yourself is, what are the big sacrifices we are knowingly and deliberately making? Because if you don't find any, then you might need to think harder about the real trade-offs that you might not yet have identified. Now, once we've got some idea on our strategy, we need to think about how to execute it. But before we talk about that, I'd like to make a transition to explain two new concepts pioneered by Robert Kaplan and David Norton in the 1990s, the balance scorecard and the strategy map. The problem they were trying to solve was that financial data comes too late to make timely decisions. Sometimes you only realize you made losses after you look at the accounts for the previous quarter. But the reason clients stopped buying last quarter was because they were unhappy about some product or service two quarters ago. And the reason that that product or service was failing two quarters ago was because some internal process was not working three quarters ago. And those processes were not working because of some problem in the hiring or training or culture one year ago. So looking at the financial statements basically only tells us about problems a year after they actually happen. Kaplan and Norton's solution to this was to suggest that we don't just measure financial results, but we also track key metrics with respect to customer satisfaction, internal processes, and learning and growth. And this was called the balance scorecard. The strategy map is a visual way of seeing how these four elements fit together. We're going to give you a comprehensive idea about what sort of elements could go into a strategy map. And that might feel a little overwhelming, but don't worry, we're going to follow it up with a simple example so you can think about how you can create one that fits your needs. Let's do the comprehensive one first. At the top of the strategy map, we look at our vision for the next two to five years and identify the most important financial metrics we want to achieve. One of the things that increases ROI or return on investment is, of course, increasing revenues. We can increase the revenue stream through entering new markets, launching new products, acquiring new clients. We can also increase the amount of revenue generated per customer by selling add-on services or offering more value to them. We can also increase profits by identifying which costs we can reduce. We can also increase the return on investment by reducing the investment, for example, getting vendors to play up earlier or by reducing the amount of stock we keep through better demand forecasting. Of course, customers are only going to pay if they're happy with what you're offering them. The product or service you're offering needs to be affordable and of good quality so it meets your customers' needs. You need to provide a wide selection and the things you're offering need to be available when they need it. The clients are looking for good service and flexibility and of course they will feel more comfortable with the recognized and established brand. Now, we can only provide a great service or product to our customers if our internal processes are purring along. The most important internal processes are to do with operations, customers, innovation and regulatory. For operations, you need to get your processes right with respect to purchasing, producing, distributing your product, and managing any risks associated with those processes. For customers, you need to be able to identify your targets, get them, keep them, and build those relationships. Your innovation processes will ensure that you don't become obsolete by identifying opportunities for new products, doing the research and design required to create them, and then launching them effectively in the market. And finally, to make sure that nothing goes off the rails, you need to have regulatory processes that deal with areas like the environment, safety, employment laws, the interests of other stakeholders, and so on. These internal processes will only work if you have the right people with the right training, with the information they need to make good decisions. And all this, of course, is built on the bedrock of software intangibles like culture, leadership, alignment, and teamwork. Now, this is the comprehensive picture, but remember, strategy involves making choices. So when you're making your strategy map, you definitely don't want to include every single process. A lot of them are running okay, and of course every process can be improved slightly, but in a strategy we only focus on the absolutely most critical ones that absolutely need to succeed for us to respond successfully to the external events around us, so we can achieve our vision. Let's give you a very simple example of a strategy map for our firm Stillwater, which has just three partners to explain how it has changed over the last few years. Our financial goal over the next few years is two crores income per partner, and we don't want to work more than eight hours a day and no weekends. The financial metrics we monitor are monthly revenue, cash flow for the next three months, and year-end profit. Your organization is likely to be far more complex than ours, so you may have more metrics that you need to track. But two years ago, we felt in order to really deliver great value to the expectations of our clients, 
we really needed to take our facilitation skills to the next level. And during the last year, in response to the COVID lockdown, our focus has been very strongly on creating new course design for the virtual world and creating an online delivery system. We feel like we've got our facilitation skills and course designs fairly set now, so next year we're really going to focus on building deep personal relationships with clients and marketing the work we're doing. Next year we have just two strategic focuses, customer servicing and brand perception. The trainer rate that clients are willing to pay us will give us a sense of the perception they have of the work we're doing, and that's something we'll be tracking. Now, in order to create this customer satisfaction, we need to focus on some processes that help us build great relationships, maybe explore customer relationship management software. We're going to track the number of active clients we have every month and have a database where we keep track of the last time we spoke to each client so we don't lose touch with them. We're also going to track the number of clients that we would call good personal friends. If we're going to work together, we need to have fun with each other, right? And finally, right at the foundation, we're going to have monthly review meetings to check our progress on these initiatives based on the metrics we're monitoring. This is one example of what a strategy map might look like. After creating your strategy map, the next step would be to brainstorm ideas, initiatives you could put in place that you haven't thought of till now, decide on stretch but realistic targets for all the metrics you'd identify, and figure out how much budget and time you want to allocate to each initiative. Finally, you need to assign outcomes and targets to individuals and link them to their personal development objectives as part of the appraisal cycle. This, in just a few minutes, is our strategy in action crash course. There is a list of questions for you to go through as you create your own strategy, and it's in the document in the link below as well. But please remember, there is no right way to do this exercise. You want to do a visual strategy map, do it. You want to write Word document and set, do it. You are the consumer of the output, so do the exercise in a way that makes sense to you and fits your context. Best of luck.